we have a lot that we can talk about and are excited to have you here. So um, our plan, uh, it feels like it has been uh, four plus more years since we saw you in Richmond last fall at East Brother Beer. Um, mm. God. And the East Bay Leadership Council obviously cares deeply about infrastructure, but we also care deeply about you. And you have been through some stuff since last we saw you. When I shipped off three books because I heard you were, you know, laid up a little bit, I thought, ah, I'll get those through through those in a day. But I did just, uh, it's great to see you. It's great to know that you are on the mend and um, excited that you continue to serve us and uh, represent us in Congress. So, um, Thank you so much for being here. So our, our, our plan today is to just open with some remarks from you about where we're headed. Um, the format is gonna be that we're gonna, after you do that, uh, your opening remarks, we'll, um, uh, I'm gonna sort of pass the reins to Leo Scott, who's with us, who's our VP of infrastructure. And uh, Leo will take the, take the helm for the, the q and I'll keep an eye on what the participants are putting in the Q&A for the Zoom, um, but we'll sort of have a, a three-way conversation after that. But um, I think certainly people have heard me talk enough and would like to pass it over Never. to you. So, um, to someone who does not need an introduction to this group, please uh, welcome Congressman Mark Desonia. Thanks. Well, thanks for those kind words and thanks for inviting me um, in these interesting times. You can tell I haven't had a haircut in a while. Um, Chanel, good, I good. I don't, I, we don't want you to go out and get a haircut, Mark. Do your thing. Yeah, that's good. Good point. I do have a haircut. I take these scissors and clip off the back. Uh, anyways, enough about me and my hair. Uh, I just, uh, first of all, want to thank you all again. Um, and I know these are tough times. Uh, I, I frequently think of my um, previous career in the restaurant business and talk to colleagues in the restaurant business um, or not anymore. Who, um, who struggle, actually. Uh, um, my partner who brought me to Contra Costa many years ago, Sam Duvall, uh, owns Izzy's in San Francisco and on the peninsula, um, just passed away uh, a week or so ago. So that brought back a flood of memories. Um, but tough times uh, for, for, for many, many, many people, including people who are um, who uh, um, own businesses. So uh, just a little background, um, I am well. Uh, I had an unfortunate accident. Um, Nancy Pelosi likes to say, uh, Mark's an example of why I don't exercise, I eat chocolate instead. Um, I was I went out for a run um, in March, March 3rd, and I had this weird freakish fall um, right in front of the Rayburn building on my way back. and. Um, 10 days later, I was in the ICU. I managed to survive uh, pneumonia, um, two serious infections, uh, septus and Mercer. Um, doctors said I had a 10% chance of survival when I was in the ICU to my um, two sons, which is tough to go through, obviously, to hear them talk about that. But here I am, um, and I am very grateful for uh, many of the strengths of our health system and, and Providence. So um, I'm doing well. Uh, Simple metric is I weighed 140 pounds. When I got out of the ICU, I now weigh about 175 um, and do better all the time. But I'm um, admonished to continue to be very thoughtful about my bubble um, and what I stay in. Um, so with that, I will stop on that segment and talk about infrastructure and what the possibilities are. Uh, I am, have been on the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee uh, for the last two sessions. Um, thanks to Speaker Pelosi, um, also on the Education and Labor Committee, and um, have been on the Oversight Committee, uh, and hope again to be on the Rules Committee, which I find fascinating and um, gives me a good deal of leverage because every bill that goes to the floor has to go through the Rules Committee. In our instance, obviously, we want infrastructure uh, that will go through um, at least two of the committees I'm on. I think portions of it will also go through the Labor Committee. Uh, at least for input, um, have a very good working relationship with um, Peter DeFazio. We like to say we both have a similar um, personal background. We both grew up in, in Boston, uh, came to San Francisco. Uh, Peter left and went to Oregon um, and now represents a district in, in southwestern uh, Oregon. Um, so we, we engaged quite a bit uh, on the infrastructure package and other issues. Uh, 
So uh, we're, we're hopeful. Um, a lot of it has to do, um, I think, with what happens in Georgia uh, and who controls the Senate. Um, I think we should have a bipartisan consensus on a bill um, for infrastructure, uh, but obviously identifying funding um, is <laughs> important. We you know, used to say it, <coughs> the restaurant business, you got to spend money to make money. Um, we, unfortunately, at the federal level, uh, uh, like the state level until just recently, we did not index our revenue source uh, to the to inflation. So the gas tax um, was not done that way and um, for political purposes. And of course that has um, cut back our, our ability to um, participate at the federal level and um, our ability to meet our, our large unmet needs. So um, our, the um, Society of Civil Engineers estimates that I think it's $3 trillion in needs uh, for infrastructure for both new and just to maintain. Uh, we've gone from being the envy of the world when it comes to infrastructure, starting in the Eisenhower administration um, in, till now where we're teetering on uh, falling below what, well, we are below what other developed countries do in terms of our commitment. So we very definitely need to do it. We need to do it for the, um, for, for the needs of investing in our infrastructure and the needs to the economy, but also at this very difficult time, it's the one thing we know uh, we can do. We had bipartisan, um, um, choosing my words here, at least uh, public comments about this, but again, identifying revenue is problematic when um, a lot of our colleagues have signed the Grover Norcrest pledge never to raise taxes. So uh, we've seen in, in the Bay Area and California that voters understand this and are willing to tax themselves, thank goodness. Um, so we're hoping we can we can get there um, and provide real revenue for real investment in infrastructure. Uh, infrastructure that's, that's um, probably gonna be really thoughtful uh, in so much as what we've learned um, in, the, in the last year uh, in multiple years before in terms of our commitment towards climate change and renewables and alternative fuels and how that applies to infrastructure. Um, and then uh, I think um, a lot of comments uh, about um, this good story, I, I think locally um, uh, about uh, people moving to Hawaii, telematics um, and telecommuting. Um, with some real opportunities, I think there. And we have to be smart about it because um, we want to make sure we're we're got as much research to make it work uh, for everyone, including those people who would be impacted by negatively by uh, more people staying home. But um, I think there's a real opportunity there. I think positively and um, um, really inclusively about doing infrastructure, but doing it based on ch ch very changing times. And then lastly, uh, with the Obama administration, um, clear that he has a real interest in this, a real commitment, particularly to climate change. Um, really hope that he picks Mary Nichols for EPA. Got great respect for Mary, although I never served with her at uh, on the Air Resources Board in the 10 years I was on there and the three governors I served under. Um, I have a good working relationship with um, with her and have nothing but great respect for her ability. Uh, and then the announcement um, of the incoming Secretary of Transportation, interesting pick. Um, so I will leave it there. I think I'm gonna be very engaged in these issues. I have some local things that um, I've talked to your leadership about and I'd like to follow up with when it comes to transition to, um, to um, alternative fuels and renewables for contra Costa. So I'll stop there. Sure. No, thank you so much. And we, um, there's been movement in that space, as you know, with Philip 66 applying mm -hmm. for a permit to, to change their feedstock from crude oil to soybeans. I mean, that's a very a big, significant change to be the largest renewable diesel in the in the world. Um, but yes, we need to have a large conversation about that. Um, and we still have a huge dependence on on traditional energy. So you know, there's there's a lot of moving parts there. But demand really sunk. And the, those industries are really hurting. And there we have seen, you know, as the um, you know, massive layoffs with the idling of the, um, of the marathon plant. So, um, but so much infrastructure to talk about. And we've had um, uh, the appointment, uh, 
President-elect Biden appointing uh, Pete Buttigieg as Secretary of Transportation. So, um, uh, and having that event earlier today. So, um, lots to discuss. So I will, like I said, turn it over to Leo Scott um, to sort of quarterback these, uh, the, the Q&A here. And, um, and then we'll keep an eye on, uh, we can ask everybody who's just listening in. Um, if you're interested, please submit your questions in the Q&A and we'll see about getting those answered. Um, take it away, Leo. All right, I think I finally got all the technical details worked out here. Can you hear me? Yes. Fantastic. Thanks, Congressman Desaulnier. I wanted to uh, kind of plug in a little earlier than I did, so I may be repeating a few things if I missed them, but I, I did catch that you had mentioned that you had done some work in the prior session with counterparts, and I, I thought that'd be a great place to start. What do you, what do you see having engaged in that process, uh, where we are, where, where are we at right now as a starting point for uh, the next reauthorization coming going forward? So I, I think um, I, we will have a bill. I'm, I'm as certain of that as uh, anything in Congress, um, which may sound <laughs> a little diminished. But, uh, <laughs> I, I really do think we have, we'll have a bill. We will have a, a bipartisan bill um, but the, the big caveat to that is identify funding. Um, so we can uh, renew the, um, reauthorize the FAST Act um, as we had a bill in this session, um, if the Senate would take it up. Uh, but that, that um, I think the biggest thing is, can we get some Republican support to identifying a, sus a sustainable funding source as we've done, as I mentioned here in California, um, mm -hmm. Which I was part of in my, my in my last two jobs as chair of the transportation committees in the legislature, um, getting to that point, and the voters being willing to um, tax themselves. And the polling around that in California, um, the PPIC polls in particular, very fascinating. The people were willing to tax themselves. Um, so, I and I think there's a lot of opportunity for uh, reform um, with a lot more performance standards. In the, at a national level um, to make sure we're moving people. And um, with also, and we put this in our bill for this session, um, a, a lot of connectivity to uh, climate change standards. Um, so renewables and alternative fuels. So I, I think there will be a bill, um, but the, the, the big unknown is um, whether we can get it, uh, identify a sustainable funding source. There has been some interest by my colleagues, and I've had these discussions uh, with some of my colleagues in the TNI committee, the Republicans. Um, interestingly enough, uh, more willingness to look at um, a, a uh, vehicle miles traveled um, bill. Uh, I, I, I was the author of that bill in the legislature that allowed Caltrans to study it, and they're continuing to study that. Um, so, but. Then when push came to shove, uh, we couldn't identify the votes to do that. Um, so I think that's the big caveat. I, we will have a bill. Um, a lot of it depends on what happens in, in the Senate races in Georgia and if we get control over the Senate, very close control. Um, but um, identifying a sustainable funding source is uh, a challenge. What do you what do you think prognosis wise here? I mean, the, the a sustainable funding source other than a gas tax modification seems like a, a tall order in the short term. So are we talking maybe two different efforts? One to get something as a continuation followed by something that's more transformative in another year or two? Um, I think both. Uh, I have been co-author of bills. I mean, the most obvious. Um, cause and effect would be a carbon fee um, that that goes back into um, both carbon reduction and um, transportation. Uh, so that's more aspirational. Uh, it should be obvious to me and uh, evidence-based research. If we just take the analytics, that, that would be the most helpful, um, at least for the next 10 years for our multiple goals. Um, but uh, more likely would be in, um, you know, I think we look at a gas tax again and try to index it would be the, the real, the, 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 the uh, simplest political thing, but it's not very simple uh, given how 
um, both houses are going to be very close. We're going to have the majority in this in the House, but um, if you're looking at 218 as a vote um, threshold, and you've only got 222 Democrats who are willing to vote, um, who knows if you can get Democrats to uh, vote and um, have to have campaigns against them that they raise taxes. On the Senate side, it's going to be within a vote or two as well. So. But the urgency of this, I think, um, is quite compelling. So um, we have to make that argument that the urgency of investing in infrastructure and being smart about it, given our climate needs, our energy needs, and our workforce needs. Um, um, I, I, I think it will happen. Uh, we're just going to have to stick, stick with it. And I think uh, we here in Contra Costa can be a real national role model. Um, and I'm happy to talk about that, Kristen. You've I'd, I'd rather have a, maybe talk about it just a little bit today, but then have another meeting where we just dedicate um, a discussion about our opportunities here in this county to really partner on all of these things and be an example for the rest of the country, given the importance of um, the refinery industry and the, the traditional energy providers, but also the opportunity to transition in a, in a thoughtful way that benefits everybody. That would be a welcome thing for sure. Uh, you mentioned in your early comments and then again, uh, Mark, on the air quality. And obviously here in California, VMT has taken center stage in the transportation decision making. Curious if, if you think that the new authorization would address air quality in VMT uh, at a greater level than in the past. And if so, how? Yeah. Um... It depends. Uh, <laughs> I, I uh, you know, that old expression that Washington is a place where good ideas go to die. Um, <laughs> I don't mean to be cynical, but having been there now for six years, it's really sort of shocking how hard it is to get things done, and particularly in this environment. Um, um, so I, I look back at my time in local government here in Contra Costa and uh, at the state level with a good deal of, um, you could get a lot done. Yeah. Um, so uh, yeah, yeah, that's the challenge is at a federal level, um, we, can, we can work with, I mean, I had these discussions with the former chair, Republican uh, Schuster, Chairman Schuster about getting more, um, had an interesting debate with the current um, Secretary of Transportation uh, about at a hearing about helping rural communities, red communities, Republican uh, communities in this country, but also helping urban and suburban and exurban areas where 64, 65% of the US economy is. So I very strongly feel we can do both, um, but uh, it, it has challenges politically. Yeah, and then, and then uh, one, one more for me for the moment, Kristen's got some questions coming in on the chat. I wanted to check in with you on autonomous vehicles and technology in, in the, the a potential new uh, bill. What, what do you see in that area? Well, I, um, I was the author of a bill and, and uh, worked closely with the transportation schools at uh, UC, uh, particularly Berkeley um, and Davis, the two Northern California, California schools, but also Riverside. Um, in Irvine, amazing resources here in California as usual. Um, uh, Susan Shaheen, who's uh, over at PATH uh, and is on the National Academy of Sciences, we just had a meeting to talk about how we can continue to provide um, investment in, in new technology and AI in particular. Um, so I'm excited about that. Of course, here in the Bay Area, we're at the forefront of this. Um, I had the chairman, um, Chairman DeFazio, come down uh, and in addition to taking a helicopter ride um, uh, three years ago, four years ago, and point out all the very difficult transportation issues uh, during the peak commute um, on 680 and 24 and 80, completely self-serving. Um, but we also went down to Google, um, went over to Uber, um, talked to all these folks, both in the public and the private sector, who have, were investing then and, and in many ways continue to invest in AI. So I think there's a lot of exciting possibilities. I think we also have to be realistic. Um, so while you're aspirational um, and want to continue to fund these projects, we also um, 
I have to understand there's a good deal of marketing around some of um, the investment community in this. So you have to be realistic, um, but you also have to be as Chris, do you want to add a couple from? Sure. The yeah, I'll get. I'll I'll do group. a couple from the from the uh, Q and A, and then pass it back to you, Leo. So just um, as follow up. So for Alex Evans, you know, our our friend who's now with HNTB, um, asks, does the same standard, meaning finding a secure funding source, apply to a recovery and or stimulus bill that would include infrastructure? You know, is do is it possible? Do you see that being? Uh, another path to just getting some infrastructure funding without without a, a a new funding source. Alex Evans, I vaguely remember that name. I'm trying to suppress part of the memory. Um, <laughs> Alex is, you know, having served back there as chief of staff for Congressman Swalwell. Um, always disconcerting to walk into caucus and see Alex sitting in the background um, with his uh, bemused look of watching politicians given his previous career as a pollster and a, a consultant. Um, I don't know how to, it's just, it's really hard. And Alex, you would understand this, I think, but particularly in other parts of the country, um, um, one of the things we have to deal with in this country is uh, how the voters get information um, and um, the accuracy of that information, both social media, 24 seven news, um, but also in campaign cycles. So uh, a Republican who will vote to raise the gas tax is um, most likely not gonna get reelected wherever they are because they're gonna get pummeled in their primary, um, either accurately, somewhat accurately. Um, so I, I just, I don't know how we get out of this mess um, unless the Koch brothers were willing to Help us, uh, I, I, and the people who fund those independent expenditures that have gone up so much. Um, I would argue with them and the Heritage Foundation. You know, we had success on uh, criminal justice reform, much like um, what we did here in California. It took us too long to do it, but if they they do um, like evidence-based research, and we can sure show them the non-political evidence-based research that shows that this investment in infrastructure is uh, the best, one of the best investments we can make for the economy. Um, so, but then there's a challenge around climate change and where um, their traditional revenue sources are. Uh, but I would like to have that discussion. I'm, I'm reaching out to them and um, like to have that discussion with them is if we can do evidence-based research, then on criminal justice reform, they moved Republicans mm -hmm. uh, significantly so that we could change how we invest um, in criminal justice reform to more evidence-based research. So if we could do that on in infrastructure and convince them, that would be my belief. Uh, and I'm gonna put, I have put some effort into this. I'm gonna put more into it to have those discussions. And then I'll just ask I'll one more for now, Leo, and then pass it back to you. We've gotten uh, several questions about uh, transit agencies. So I'll just use the words of Chris Weeks from Sunset Development. Um, our local transit agencies are planning for a budget apocalypse. Workforce transportation is on the chopping block. Should transit agencies cut service to bare bones, eliminating commuter service? Well, I think they have to be responsive. I mean, we're all being responsive to uh, uh, once every hundred years pan worldwide pan uh, I'm being redundant, pandemic. <laughs> Um, so, uh, I mean, we can look around the industrialized world and see best practices um, where agencies have been more responsive. My understanding is, as is frequently the case, the South Koreans and the Japanese um, have have cut. And of course, you know, in those cases, uh, their peak trips that are used by by um, particularly non-transit dependent population is much higher than ours. I mean, in the mm -hmm. Bay Area, we had a lawsuit when I was on MTC um, where we were just put in the regional transportation plan that we would get to 10%. We'd never get 10%. If you're in London, um, Tokyo, um, at most urban developed countries, uh, it's 60, 70%. So I, we have to go there. We have to get more people on transit and of course, in this public health environment, um, it creates another challenge as we feel, figure out how we live with a pandemic and post 
um, vaccine, which we're very hopeful will be successful. So um, I have a number of initiatives in this regard. We've got to get ridership up. Uh, but we have to have the infrastructure sustain itself. Um, so they've got to cut back, they got to be smart about it. Um, but we have to provide them with as much uh, revenue as we can to get them through this, just like we need to do for small businesses or for people who are um, need unemployment assistance. So uh, that's why this next week is important. And I, I do think um, the first quarter of the new administration will be very important mm -hmm. uh, as we try to move um, out of this pandemic and into a new world of um, different energy sources, more transit dependency in the United States. I, well, I'm, I'm really excited about being in the middle of that, by the way. Yeah. Well, it, it go, before I pass it back to you, Leo, I would be remiss if I didn't let you know that the chat, the Q&A, and now my phone via text is lighting up with Debbie Toast's commentary about the impact on frail elders, people with disabilities, and mobility challenges if, if there are significant cuts. Um, and so uh, that's preaching to the choir to you um but i just wanted to say that out loud and on the recording so are you, um, are you deliberately so bringing up people who i have long relationships so friendship? not my first rodeo <laughs> sir <laughs> not my first rodeo no 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 <laughs> sir all right leo i'll pass it back to you keep an is eye on Alex well, this, this, this. <laughs> he, he are, he's our surprise guest no just yeah. uh continue on sir well so so mark while we're while we're sort of on the theme of past relationships, I, I wanted to touch bases on Plan Bay Area 2050. I, I imagine you're following uh, Teresa's challenges with Plan Bay Area 2050. And uh, as, you, as you know from that, there are some fairly significant transit-related uh, projects, almost mm -hmm. program-level type uh, projects in there. Link, Link 21 with BART and Capital Corridors, Caltrain into the Trans Bay Terminal, BART to San Jose, Valley Link. I'm wondering what your thoughts are in terms of funding through a federal reauthorization for projects of that magnitude to kind of facilitate some of what you're talking about in terms of increasing transit ridership and interest in transit trips. Um, well, first, I have great respect for Therese. Um, I had great respect for her predecessor, although we, we, we had a challenged um, relationship. Uh, so I think that's a political way of saying it. Um, I, I get very frustrated with the Bay Area. Um, I go to other parts of the country and the world um, and the state and uh, um, the politics is much more functional in my view. Um, and I came from this background. Um, and we have to compete with those folks. Uh, you know, I, I and you've, well, many of you have heard the expression in the restaurant business that I apply to politics and the economy in the Bay Area. The restaurant business is, as an expression was volume hides all management mistakes. And I would, uh, my caveat to that is only for a while. Um, the Bay Area has been blessed by so many things, our research facilities, our entrepreneurial spirit. Um, and if, as somebody who came here from uh, Boston that has a similar, um, um, we compete with Boston, Washington, um, but has a different culture. I just, it, it uh, frustrates me. Um, so I, you got to be open-minded to these different ideas uh, <laughs> in the Bay Area of all places. Uh, we can't shoot them down politically, just, you know, the issue of um, telecommuting. You can't jump right out and say that the discussion in NPC about the RTP and telecommuting, um, we don't want. We got to be. We've got to all be open-minded to it. And this is somebody who, you know, understands the importance of um, having people commute into an area where, if you own a restaurant, you need people coming in. Uh, Bank of America and Chevron were big customers, mine and Cocker, uh, when they were there. Wells Fargo. So, um, yes, there'll be investment in big projects. I think we will. Uh, states right. We will. Um, um, allow for states and, and MPOs to make those decisions based on, as I think we should. The challenge, of course, again, goes back to the revenue. The, the his, historically, uh, when I started in transportation, um, the formula was 80, 75% federal funding and uh, 20, 30% local and state. Now it's flipped. Um, if we had the federal government contributing the way California does and Contra Costa does, uh, that's the kind of investment we need. Um, 
and that's going to be a challenge, but we're going to have to stick with it. I, I do think we'll get there and um, the strategy of getting some of the key supporters of um, the Republican primaries to, to support us on that, I think would be most helpful. I think that's the best way to get it done. Yeah, maybe along that theme, I, the, one, of the, one of the newer concepts over the last couple of years has been a regional express bus service mm -hmm. to, to make use of the, the emerging express lanes. So obviously there would be a, an infrastructure investment in the express yep. lanes and then operating for, for the buses. Uh, that seems like a, something that for 680 in particular would be ideal uh, because obviously we're not gonna get rail through the, the uh, Tri-Valley area or down to the Tri-Valley. So I'm interested again in, in your thoughts and, and how that would perhaps play out in a federal, federal reauthorization. Fund, no, funds I, for projects of that sort. Yeah, I will argue for that very strenuously. Um, it's a smart investment. We've done it. The Contra Costa Transportation Authority, um, MTC. I mean, these are good investments in there. You can get the projects done quickly. Uh, you go to these conferences around the country, the world, and you know, especially around the country, rail is bad um, in the in the sense of it's a big investment. It takes a long time. I would argue. Um, that those kind of investments we need to continue to make, obviously, um, and the rest, as I said, the rest of the industrialized world has done it successfully. So, but um, rapid bus, express buses, and back to the question about AI, I think that's a real opportunity there where um, along with uh, goods movement, that looks like where we could spend the money and get it to work uh, most quickly rather than focusing on single occupancy vehicles and AI. So I think there's a real, 680 corridor has a great um, potential for increased ridership. You know, if you look at the old, um, the old maps of uh, what BART was supposed to look like when the voters approved that, um, for those who have seen those old maps, uh, there was a rail line down 680. Um, that's before the voters found out about it, I guess. Between Creek <laughs> and Dublin. <laughs> Well, and, and it sort of that, that kind of brings up the question of, okay, so we put an express bus service on 680, you still need to get connected to it and the last mile connections become important. Yeah. And the cities of you know, some of the cities, Dublin, San Ramon with uh, Bishop Ranch are all exploring uh, driverless shuttle services and or other means to connect. And right now, the way our freeways are designed, we have to get those buses literally completely off the freeway to connect with whatever the last mile shuttle yeah. connection is. A grander vision could provide more uh, expeditious connections, uh, yeah. but you've got to get facilities to do that. And then you've got to pay for the services to get there. So, you know, again, we're kind of exploring different ways that we could achieve transportation, but funding from the reauthorization would need to be available for that kind of thing. So what, what uh, thoughts you have on last mile connectivity? Uh, as part of the reauthorization? Well, I, I've been very involved uh, in last mile since I was a county supervisor. We had a, a grant with um, that I helped to get, get done. Um, it was both a federal and state grant uh, that looked at Pleasant Hill Bart when I, when I was a county supervisor and that was in my um, supervisory district. And Susan Shaheen from PATH um, did that grant. It was modeled on something that uh, the Irvine Transportation School did at their rail station. Um, so the idea is, and Randy Isaka was the Isaka was the lead person at, at uh, um, Caltrans on IT, intelligent transportation systems. We can do this, and it includes AI. But you know, with the apps and real time transportation information, um, getting people to um, get from their home to their transit station. Um, and use technology to get them there uh, really needs, we need to spend more money on that urban areas. Um, and I think we can do it. I, I really do think there's a critical moment here with that kind of infrastructure. So yeah, I'd be, I am and, and will continue to be very engaged in those issues, try to get more funding um, to, for deployment of this kind of, and get quarters. We've got quarters. It's part of the RTP. It's been part of the RTP for a long time to focus on these really important quarters in the Bay Area to, to move people, get them out of their residence, um, get them to the transit stations and get them to work and back. And, and 
also allow for the flexibility for the trips uh, to get to childcare, to, to get to um, grocery shopping. And all those things are doable, but we've got to provide the infrastructure and then change the culture so people get used to it. Great. All right, Kristen's got a few more, I think. Kristen? I do, I do. So I'm um, going to go a little bit meta for a second. So Gary Zyla from Asset Mark has a great question. Um, you know, he's read that the two areas where there is room for collaboration and, and compromise in the Congress that is so divided would be infrastructure and China. Um, and do you, what do you think about that? And also what other areas do you think uh, could be focused on? Um, to find to find agreement. Yeah, so historically for years, uh, saying in on the House side was that uh, the transportation infrastructure was the least partisan uh, committee that you could get on. Um, so that if you wanted to get accomplishments, you you know you believed in problem solving, you wanted to get on that committee. Uh, it has become less so, not because of me, um, but because of the issues I've talked about. Uh, Citizens United, in my view, affected. Um, transportation infrastructure because of the growth of independent expenditures in campaigns, particularly directed at Republican primaries. Um, and we've got the history of that now. We know, I, I mentioned the people who are behind that. So we have to convince them um, to help us convince the members um, that they have helped get elected and helped intimidate, in my view, um, to be frozen on these issues. So. Uh, it's, it's, it's ironic, and uh, one of the frustrations I find is that uh, um, it used to be you went to the business community um, to get help as a former Republican um, on these issues, uh, and you have become less influential in spite of you, meaning the business community, both locally and at state level. Um, but hopefully we can change that back. Uh, so. With, this I is, won't take I'm, that. I'm, I won't take that personally because you still take my calls. But yes, no, I no, think you know, I, no, no, I think no, it's, no. Real, it's a yeah. I, no, it's I, a real issue. I, yeah. And I have a subjective feeling about yeah, this because yeah, my own yeah. business. I mean, yeah, yeah. I can remember when Pete Wilson was governor, um, getting Alex, getting some key business people in the Bay Area who could make that call, partially because the global economy that's more difficult now yeah. um, to go to a CEO in in, uh, in the state of California and have them be able to make a phone call. Um, so there's, it's complex, but um, we want the economy to grow for everybody and we want to change the fifth of the economy for our energy um, to where we want it to be. These things have got to be um, discussed. So I, and I am really encouraged by um, my interaction with the, the Biden administration. I love to say that. Uh, in, 40, in 40 years of this administration, I never had a meeting with a liaison from the administration. Um, and for all the differences that I had with the individual, um, I like to get things done, and I made that clear. Yeah. Uh, within a week of the election, um, I had the my liaison from the administration reach out to me and have multiple conversations about how we can work together. So I, I, I have a lot of hope for this administration. And if we can get Senator McConnell um, and and the minority leader um, to engage us in these discussions, I think we could we could have mm -hmm. a remarkable couple of years. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to go back down and then get specific because we have a number of, of questions around uh, more specific components. So um, I'll just kind of tick through them. What specific priorities in terms of policies and funding are you pushing to have included in a FAST Act reauthorization? And I'll add a piggyback onto that, which is, a question about earmarks. Are earmarks coming back? And if so, what would you want earmarked from these parts? Um, well, I had this discussion with both Nancy and Steny. Um, Steny really wants them to not get back in earmarks. Um, sorry to be so negative, but when, until we change the other, the other component here um, in terms of how people get elected, particularly on the, on the Republican side, um, we're not gonna be able to get it because as long as a member knows that they're going to, uh, yeah, I never really realized this until I went back, the effect of these independent expenditures, but for the rest of the country, um, you know, if you get elected from a, particularly a Republican district, your family has lived in that district for multiple generations. Being a member of Congress is a big psychological thing um, for who you are and, you, and 
where you are in the community you live in. And unfortunately, these powers um, in the Koch brothers have targeted Republican primaries. Um, and I can see it, good members leave. And these are conservative people who I disagree with ideologically, but they, you can work with them. I mean, it's yeah, just you have part a counterpart. Of yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's the part of the American heritage. It's Hamilton and Jefferson, individual um, and, and social contract. So that part, I think, is a healthy conversation, but they have been inhibited um, by this use of independent expenditures that they're psychologically are going to be, they're, they're not just they're, they're going to lose the election, but they are going to be destroyed in a community where they have multiple generations of identity. And they're not real interested in moving. <laughs> right. So it, it, it's really um, um, dark money is a, and everything that Jane Mayer has written about this is illustrative. And I don't, it's just common sense would indicate why can't we just get this done? Mm -hmm. um, but that, that inhibits our ability to get it done. Well, and, and you might have already just answered this question because there's a number of questions in our Q&A around different funding streams, right? And you've covered this a bit already about the, the peril of voting for a gas tax, but there is some interest in what about user fees and toll roads and what can be done around that? Do you have any, any yeah. hopes around that or what can be done to make that a possible or is that still not okay in the multi-generational Republican world? I think we have to change all of that. And I would remind people when I was in the legislature, when we were in the in a um, recession bordering on a depression, um, and I was up there, we got five Republicans to vote with us. Two, two in the assembly, Roger Nilo, who is a great member, um, very conservative, uh, but a great member to work with, a prominent business owner, um, including his family owning a business in Contra Costa. Uh, and then three in the in the Senate. None of them ever got elected to office again. They didn't win a primary. So just that as illustrative here in California, the challenges. Um, so we just have to change this. We have to stick with it. We have to make a, a really um, evidence-based but passionate. Uh, we've got to invest in, in, in infrastructure. That's what made this country great. Mm -hmm. um, our educational system, I mean, these are cliches, but it's the truth. Uh, and evidence-based research shows us that. If we, if we invest in, in education, if we keep what we've got now, these amazing colleges, I mean, seven of the 10 best public universities in the world are UCs. Uh, we have to keep in, and we have to re-engage in these investments and in infrastructure. And if we do, um, um, we'll, we'll do well. So but we have to convince our colleagues that we need to do that. Um, and not stupidly. I think there's a lot of reform we can do to be, to, to um, improve our investments um, in that regard. Mm -hmm. um, China, I, 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 I think there's potential there, but I'm not sure. Um, and the Pacific Rim is a big part of all of this, by the way. Uh, one of the things we, you all are aware of, um, but a lot of my colleagues in the rest of the country aren't, and they, if they are aware, they resent it. Uh, we have moved in the last 50 years from a dominant Atlantic economy to um, a almost dominant uh, Pacific economy. Mm -hmm. um, so that relationship with China is going to continue to change. I don't know any economist who doesn't argue that, uh, I mean, California is wonderfully placed in this world because uh, we get the best of both. We're right in the middle of a global economy that is anchored by um, China and Asia and Europe, continues to be. So um, I think there are opportunities, particularly in the um, three to five to 10 years where uh, China and the Pacific Rim and a global economy and us right in the middle of it um, will be bipartisan. Well, good. Fingers crossed. Bipartisan is good. Um, I so a, a, a question came in that kind of links both of two of your committee assignments, and it relates to construction costs. So construction costs for the specialized work that transportation infrastructure requires have been escalating as exponentially. One of the reasons is the lack of construction staffing. What can and should be done to address the skilled labor pipeline? So. Um... And if, if it's okay, Christine, I'll segue a little bit because I know I'm being wordy, but these are good questions. <laughs> um, and they're complex. Uh, so um, 
when we look, uh, I started a thing called the Future of Work, Wages, and Labor with uh, three colleagues that became much larger, um, FOWL, uh, that we're going to work on in this Congress. Uh, we did that six years ago. We started mm -hmm. at, uh, uh, the, at Berkeley um, with, the, with Stanford, uh, and then we went to Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, we went to Ann Arbor with Michigan, uh, Rutgers, all these really good schools and researchers on um, what is the future work and how do we prepare for it? Um, and it's not all AI and tech and, and coders. You got to provide people who get out there um, and do the work and have high school degrees. So I, we have a really good model here in California uh, and specifically in Contra Costa. It's not without its challenges and differences, um, but it's a good model. And that is uh, you invest in career technical development um, in continuous education, like the Germans do in manufacturing, um, and the Swiss, and um, you you develop these high wage jobs that we need in high cost of living areas, um, but you get value out of it. Um, at the refineries, uh, having been very involved in this in the industrial safety ordinance and SB fifty four, um, Jerry Brown called me before he signed that bill, and he he said, "I remember I was driving around Oakland." Um, and he says, okay, DeSonia, your name keeps coming up. How do we make this work? And I said, Jerry, you appoint the five people on the Apprenticeship Standards Board. If we, if we um, make that board create value for everybody who gets apprenticeship um, skills, and we invest in that, the contractors and the labor unions, and if non-affiliated contractors want to invest, they can. But if you bring those standards up and people get value, then they're willing to invest in that. That's worked pretty pretty damn well um, in this county. So there's a model there. Um, we have to get it in 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 K through 12. Um, well, yeah, through, yeah, through K through 12. Um, and we have to get it in career development. And we've done that here. Uh, community college district's been a good partner. So we can we can get better in that. But that that I actually have bills and I don't want to go, but I have some bills in this regard. Um, where Davis-Bacon requirements would be more interacted uh, with more components, including value added uh, and, and um, uh, value capture. I've had hours of meetings with the French rail system uh, to, to understand more fully with Peter and our staff um, about value capture that works in the rest of the industrialized world when it comes to transportation and development. Um, so I have a very large bill about that. that, that um, I'm very excited about, and it connects all of these things, career development and um, apprenticeship standards and people who are gonna get paid well, who will have disposable income in high cost areas, but also provide value for their employers. Mm -hmm. um, oh, there's, I have like a hundred questions to follow up on that, but I wanna be respectful that Leo is our VP of infrastructure and not suck up all of our uh, uh, time there. Cause I am mindful that we're in the last 10 minutes. So. Well, Kristen, let's let's talk about follow up. How we get the communication because uh, sure. this is this is timely around uh, the just transition subject that I'd like to spend. If I try to do thirty seconds, it'll be at least sixty seconds. But I would like to in the conversations <laughs> that we've had um, segue yeah. to that because I want to be engaged with you folks and make this work. And I think it's a real opportunity. Please do. Well, and that was that was going to be my next question, actually, Mark, was uh, you offered to connect with us. What are your thoughts as to how we can do that? Because uh, we obviously have multiple task forces that touch on the issues you've registered here. We started off with transportation, but we're, we're moving into workforce development now. Any of those are good topics uh, to uh, well, talk with you about, probably in a focused way. Yeah, so just um, as briefly as I mentally can do it. Um, we have a bill. Um, we're pretty confident in our ability to get at least an amend amendment language in in the next couple of years that would create a pro grant program for what's called just transition uh, to transition workforces um, out of traditional energy um, facilities into renewables. Um, and it's interesting. Um, the future Secretary of uh, Energy, uh, mm -hmm. former Governor of Michigan, and uh, a, a uh, Oakland resident. Yeah. yeah. Where does she live? Is she a constituent? I've got to call She's her. not a constituent, but she lives, so she lives in Oakland, not by. Yeah, not very yeah. close by. Yeah. Um, so what I'd like to do is um, develop a grant program 
for local jurisdictions to engage stakeholders, employers, employees, unions, um, um, environmental groups, social justice groups uh, on how do you take the current infrastructure for energy and transition us. We have a really good model um, and the Labor Institute and the energy folks at Berkeley had a good deal to do with this in California on the renewable portfolio, but we never did it on the mobile source side. Um, so we need to do that. We always knew we need to do that. So where do the, the, the steel workers who work in those refineries, uh, where do they go to get jobs? Um, where do they, the next generation go to get jobs? Uh, where, the, where do the building trades and the, and the carpenters and the laborers go? So I've been convening people both at the state, local and the federal level to develop a grant program. And what I have in mind is specifically uh, for us and we have to be competitive uh, with other jurisdictions around the country, but I think we're uniquely set um, to get federal grant money to convene these groups and figure out how we move people from um, our refineries into other jobs uh, and multi-generationally, but also right now the urgency of now. That is to, for right now, it's into um, an infrastructure bill. How do you build out the infrastructure and have that infrastructure be more renewables and alternative fuel, fuel vehicles? As I told Kristen, and, and this is very important for local government. Um, as you all know, um, the people who fund East Bay leadership also fund municipal government in this in this county. Um, so um, of the 10 largest taxpayers, um, those four refineries are all in the top 10. Uh, and their multipliers are 14 jobs for every one job they have in here. So I'd like to have this discussion um, and in multiple ways uh, so that you folks can have your staff and interested people intersect with my folks. Um, and then they will intersect with the committee of jurisdictions and colleagues, folks. Um, and I would like to have a, convene a, a working group um, this year to start on this. And then we become a national model um, on how to transition, but not just for the workforce, for municipal government, how they get funded for um, the climate and for energy. And I'm really excited about the and then the last component about this that we, we are uniquely, um, we have a unique opportunity for, we have two DOE facilities on um, you know, both sides of my district in this county mm -hmm. that have amongst the best and the brightest energy folks. And then we have researchers at the University of California. So we, this is, you can tell, I'm very excited about the opportunity around this. So Kristen, how we should um, strategize at the staff level and above on how we have a larger discussion and then build the infrastructure. So um, as I've explained to other people, the gestalt of this is bringing you know, the stakeholders in and having meaningful input, but still having be the harmony of having us, us all on the same page in a work product that doesn't go sideways, uh, including with political leadership. Well, and I, I appreciate your sensitivity there, Mark, because some of the the there's a, a number of things whether it's how contra cost is redoing its general plan um there can be language out there where people forget these are privately held assets that have a right to operate and so it's important to make sure that 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 the that the industry itself those private sector leaders those really really smart environmentalists um because some of the people that are the strongest environmentalists i know are the leaders in those in those agencies so if i can help by, by, because I work so closely with them and be involved in that, I want to definitely take a deep dive. Um, so I appreciate that that's uh, on your radar to, to get ahead. And, and, and the, the connectivity to the economy and what's happened with HP, um, with Cisco, um, with companies moving, we, we, we can't go, we, we can't get in a race to the bottom, mm -hmm. um, but we can still do what we've always done is um, have progressive politics that also helps the private sector. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think it could, I mean, obviously there are plenty of models around the world that you can do both, but we can, this is part of this discussion. Yeah. It's not just the transition of the workforce, it's transition of the economy that it has direct implications to everything you just mentioned, mm -hmm. quality of life, um, education, all these things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And still be focused, 
You know, mm -hmm. I, we've been in enough meetings over our lifetimes, many of us, where we just started off with well-intentioned, how are we going to focus on this? And it went all over the place. Yeah. yeah. I understand that I have some <laughs> personal responsibility there. <laughs> 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 well, so then, uh, so Mark, uh, in terms of workforce development, that, that's a great place. Are you also seeing that working group structure working on the transportation side as well or, or rolled into that? Uh, you have to roll it into it. And um, this is going to be a discussion with the administration that I hope I'm engaged in, and I believe I will be, is uh, we look at a transportation infrastructure of the future, obviously it's related to energy. Um, and climate change, but also workforce development and land use. You can't, I mean, you can't keep doing land mm -hmm. use the way we've done in California, in the Bay Area. And we've had a lot of benefit by protecting open space and we should continue to do that. And we can, we can do higher density. I, I drive by Pleasant Hill Park now and um, 10, 10 years ago, I was really proud of the density we got there. And now I drive by and go, God damn it, that should have been denser. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, hindsight's twenty twenty. Well, I um I am aware of our time, and we are. It's at one twenty nine, and I do want to just um take a point of privileges. You know this, but um the Food Bank of Contra Costa and Solano is a member of the East Bay Leadership Council, and the demand for their services is up sixty five percent since the beginning of the pandemic. And I know that you get the the responsibility and the privilege to vote on whatever potential package comes your way, but there, it's not just, this is such an uneven impact on the economy and on people and on your constituents and on all of us. And so I know that we uh, really do want to see some movement and through our 501c3, we're leading the Contra Costa Equitable Economic Recovery Task Force and um, really want to see some movement there. So anything you can do, um, hopefully there is something that's going to happen this week um, uh, to get to get some movement. Are, are you optimistic? Can I just do, do you have 10 seconds on if there's going to be a package this week? Um, I, I need to go to therapy to talk about what's going to happen this week. Um, I, I am optimistic. Uh, I don't know why these institutions, uh, legislative bodies have to go right up to the cliff where they right. um, are motivated to make decisions. It's part of our culture, unfortunately, but we need to change it. Um, but yeah, I, I am optimistic. Um, and then we're going to have another challenge in three months, four months. Um, so we're going to get, hopefully to March, um, we're going to have um, some support for unemployed, more support for uh, small businesses. Um, so, and then uh, it's, I don't know whether this is set up or not, but my last appointment was with a food bank. Did, did, were they talking to you? Um, I've uh, been paying, I just, I've been paying attention. I, I pay attention. So yes. Yeah. So, so that's a whole, that's a whole lot other, to do there. Yeah. That's a whole lot of the discussion. Um, you, you can't, you can't have the inequality we currently have mm -hmm. in this country and in the Bay area and have the economy work. Not, it's not just a moral question, but you can't have a strong middle class. And again, I think, um, this is a unique place for the president elect. I mean, we've got to perform here. We know what it looks like going in to um, uh, a house election cycle uh, with an incumbent in your own party. Mm -hmm. So we got to hit the ground running. And um, I hope our colleagues would join us and we'll change the culture in Washington because we need to. Okay. So Thank you for doing this. And I'll just, I'll get on, get on your calendar to have that deep dive and have the follow-up. So I really appreciate it. Thank you, Mark, for sharing your time and being with us. Thank you all. This is great. Bye. Happy holidays. Be safe. Yeah. Happy holidays. Wash your hands. Likewise. Stay, stay apart, but be together. Thanks everybody.